My name is Guilherme Castanho. I'd like to talk to you today about the theme sewage as a source of resources. Over the last years and decades, actually more than a century, the whole humanity has treated sewage as a problem that needs to be treated. But this is starting from a wrong logic, because sewage is not a problem. The sewage can be a solution for countless things. If we stop and think, what is the sewage after all? It's nothing more than a constant flow of water with organic matter and nutrients and also incorporate energy that can be used. All of this is available in any scale that we are working on it, from a house to a city. The target of this conversation is a small scale. What you can do in your house or in your small enterprise to deal with in a smarter way. If we stop to look at the house or enterprise as an organism, we will understand that there is a outflow that we naturally call sewage. This outflow consists of larger or smaller portions of water a certain concentration of organic matter. What happens is that of the whole amount that is produced in a house, around 75% of it is what we call gray water. And another 25% is what we call black water. On those 25%, it's what needs to be effectively treated. And inside of our own body, if we look at our excretory system, we will understand that there is a liquid flow, the urine, and a solid flow, the feces. People seek to find ways to expand as less as possible to try, in a sense, to solve this problem. Throw in a hole in the ground, eventually in water streams, in rivers, and they don't care who will be affected. So when you're misusing this sewage, and end up throwing at inappropriate places and dealing with it inappropriately. We end up contaminating people that is after us. But it's always good to remember that there is people before us. So it's time to see ourselves inside a flow, inside a circle, and willing to enter a virtual cycle, a cycle where we can produce resources that can be reintegrated into the productive cycle. Throughout history, several nations were able to manage sewage in a much more intelligent way than ours in these days, even in 2017. If we take an example relatively new of several countries southeast of Asia, of which the rice fields were integrated to urban areas, where in fact there was a market of people's excretions, excretions of nighttime and for this was given a name called night soil there were traders that collect these materials and would take them to boats and in these boats there was a market then this material was taken to crop fields around the city so throughout this we used to create a direct relation nutrients entering the field and return of food to the city and this is a closed cycle in our cities and even in the form of dealing with agribusiness the fertilizers are brought from outside and the cycles don't close not only by the sewage that end up contaminating water it doesn't come back to fertilize cultivated areas but also the very remains of food end up being discarded brought to dumping ground and miss this opportunity to come back to the fertilization cycle. So the population growth that we generally see as a problem actually can be a big opportunity because the more people we have in the planet, the more fertilizers are being produced. Every person produces around 50 liters of solid feces per year and produce others 500 liters of urine. And this nature of urine facilitates a lot this dynamic of nutrients conduction because urine is liquid so we didn't even need it water to conduct these nutrients to wherever we want to use them on the other hand we have 
if we look at the total quantity of nutrients produced by one person, we will have the equivalence in fertilizer production. 230 kilos of crops and grains each person per year. So when we look at the total quantity of these nutrients available throughout our liquid and solid feces, around 94% of the nutrients are present in the urine and just only 6% are present in the feces. That means that our feces can be used more as a soil designer than nutrients themselves. Within the mobility cycle of these nutrients, the nitrogen is available in the atmosphere and it keeps circulating inside the atmosphere, sometimes through the air, and it's discharged into the soil through atmospheric discharges, and this is incorporated by the plants throughout their growth. And after that, it goes back to the soil as nutrients. You have a cycle that is continually recirculating in the planet. The phosphorus, which is another essential nutrient for the plants, and of which good part of the chemical fertilizers are based on, it is exploited as a mining. It is available in phosphate rocks, so that is this mining process that takes out this material and transforms it into fertilizers that can be used in cultivations. A good part of these nutrients, when applied on the soil, it is simply washed down by rain and it will end up being in water, streams, and rivers, and in the end, they will all go to the ocean. So the sea ends up being the deposit of all the source of phosphorus that we have seen being extracted along the years. And with the inadequate practices of agriculture, all these material have the tendency to go back to the ocean. And this caused not only this overgrowth of algae, seaweeds, especially all these changes in the food chain due to this overgrowth of the plants, this great availability of phosphorus, but also generates a lack of phosphorus in long term within the continents. So what we are exploring here is an opportunity to create ways to recycle the phosphorus inside your own property. In other words, everything that is ingested by you returns to cultivate food or all the plants that you want. Before you talk about techniques, it's important to talk about some concepts that will guide us for some choices which will be more appropriated for each concept because there is no the best technique. There is the one more appropriated for each one of those diverse contexts that we are in. The first one has to do with culture. The culture of the place, the culture of the people that are going to use this system, people that flush the toilet, or those that will be using this infrastructure. The system must be in accordance with the culture base of those people that will be using this system. In this image, I'm showing you an arm of a toilet in Japan. You can see there are several buttons, a button for music, a button to splash water in the butt, a sound volume for the flushing time, a music for background. Imagine how those people in Japan will deal with a regular bathroom. How would they deal with a regular seat where they simply lift the toilet seat and inside there's no clear water, no music, no hot water splash. So we need to adequate these techniques according to local culture. Not only those people that will use, but also those that will operate the system. In this case, we're talking about the user, but that is the other end of the system, where the management of this flow of material will occur. Another important factor is climate. You can use an amazing technique in a place, and then you want to use this technique in another place where it will be totally inappropriate, just because the weather. I'm going to show you an example of the dried bathroom. It will be very easy to understand this. 
the type of soil affects this a lot because especially if you count on a system of water infiltration into the soil after usage if your soil has higher or lower capacity of infiltration it will be more or less adequate for the system you use if you also have the water table too close to the soil surface you have to consider it as a determining aspect the idea is that we have a minimal distance of 1.5 meter between the point of application of water after purification until the water table. So there is no risk of contamination. So if you are in a place where the water table is very shallow, the infiltration systems are more dedicated and demanding. It will need the water quality to be much better. The fact that you have more or less water will change the technique to be used actually going to change the role of possible techniques that you use also the available space it will limit you in terms of especially especially if you want to use big water systems to produce fish or plants you will be limited because of this and your goal what do you want with this system after all what do you want to do with these nutrients, this energy, and this water flow? The choice of this technique will be made based on the combination of so many variables. For places where the water table is high, where water availability is eventually lower, and where you want to deal with your nutrients without water, the dried bathroom is an excellent alternative. The dry bathroom allows you to reconstruct the nutrient cycle inside your property. It makes the food that you cultivated be returned in form of nutrients to the soil through the process of composting of your resources. There are many ways to build a dried bathroom from a model that perhaps is the most well-known in Brazil, which is a chamber model or dry compostable bathroom where you have a composting chamber right underneath the seat so while you're doing your business defecating the system you will add sawdust all of this material stay in the composting chamber and over time it will turn into fertilizer by itself but there i have an important tip remember i mentioned to you the issue of the climate the dry bathroom is a classic case i will show you two images for you one of the images show a dried bathroom with two people, Bira and Andre, dealing with, with the material already quite decomposed at the exit of the composting chamber. And on the right bottom, you see a picture also with a chamber painted with a black roof in Bahia State, with Betinho, our partner from Salvador, Bahia, presenting the example to us. And the main difference we can see, not in the technique and the way it was built, but is in the result of the composting process. Because the system in Bahia was basically dehydrated. It was not fulfilling the composting function. Practically, it turned into a dehydrator bathroom. It's not what we want. Because if we take a dehydrated material, it will have very little function as a fertilizer per se for the soil. There are four important variables for our process of composting. is the carbon-nitrogen ratio, temperature, oxygen, and humidity. After usage, you add an amount of sawdust and ashes. Actually, you are pouring a quantity of carbon that will regulate the quantity of nitrogen present in the feces. This will create a relation between carbon and nitrogen appropriated to accelerate the process of composting. The sawdust used is generally thick. It is preferable to use coarse material. It can be crushed straw or leaves because it will add volume and it will allow that the oxygenation of this compound can occur in a more proper way and keep promoting the acceleration of the composting process. It also needs to be a bit damp, not too much nor too little. If it has less water, it will be dehydrated, as we saw in the picture of Bahia. And if it has too much water, it will have a risk of entering the process of anaerobic decomposition. And this will feel by the smell. 
the anaerobic decomposition produce a type of gas that is composed of sulfuric gas, the sulfur, and this smell of sulfur is very typical. It will smell like a rotting egg. So if your compost has a strong smell, you know that it's probably too humid and that has affected this dynamic of the composting process. Also, we have the issue of temperature. Now, within all of these variables, even if we are seeking conditions, so the composting can happen as fast as possible. However, it's important that this composting happens in an efficient way. In other words, we want to have a quality in this compost that is secure, so it can be used in your cultivation without any problems. And within the composting process, there are different phases of temperature because the process is exothermic. It releases heat. And at the beginning, it has a big elevation of temperature. It reaches 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, and it stays at this temperature for some days. And as we can see, the destruction of the most resistant pathogens, the destruction of the E. coli specifically, will happen after 60 minutes at this temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. So if we have a good composting process, we also guarantee the sanity of this compost. It's important to keep in mind that this is not made for vegetables, but other crops and cultivations. This resting time of the compost is more important or it will take us to a safer condition of this compost than the temperature elevation itself. So since we separate the feces inside the composting chamber of your dried bathroom, we can also think about taking advantage of this urine. As I said before, it is a rich source of nutrients. How is this done? It's simple. We all have different outlets of liquid. This material can be diluted, one part for ten parts of water, or can be stored for at least six months. This six months is a secure time frame suggestion for some pH changing process to occur that will make any virus that could be present in the urine be dead. Actually, the urine is sterile, and unless the person is sick, and there you have a chance of virus transmission, but generally is a safe liquid. Besides collected materials from urinals, there are already some types of toilets that allows to separate liquid to solid flows. The image you see on the screen, you can see the reference of a seat which is installed in a German agency of cooperation at GIZ, where they do some studies to recover some nutrients of this building. You can also see an image of a research of this gentleman called Peter Morgan, which is available on this site, Alliance for Sustainable Sanitation, Susanna.org where he did a study about the application of a different concentration of urine for corn cultivation. The same corn seed cultivated on the same day under the same insulation and irrigation conditions. And you can see the huge difference that the corn cubs have at the end of cultivation. You can see on the right corn image a very small corn cub, just few grains with zero urine and the image on the left with almost two liters of urine applied throughout the cultivation time. The tip is if you are applying in vegetables, you have to be careful because you need to wait at least one month between your application and the consumption of the fertilized food. So if we recall that 75% of the whole water volume produced in a house is gray water, which is the water from shower, from washer machines, lavatory, sinks, this water has no pathogens. So necessarily, this water doesn't have to be treated unless you have a specific condition of a elevated water table. Otherwise, you can use this water to fertilize different environments of your land. So, for instance, you can imagine that while you are taking shower, 
that every minute in the shower you produce around 10 liters of water between 10 to 15 liters it means that in five minutes you have at least 50 liters of water that could be used in a irrigation of any fruit tree or some of them think about a plinia cauliflora tree or citrus fruits in general a certain amount cherry our native fruits typical of riparian forests. These plants like gray water because they like humid and alkaline environments. So we study these types of trees according to your climate and you know what trees you can plant. And looking to nature with different sources of water, you can notice that some sources of water are in proper quality to be reused right away. In other words, it doesn't need treatment. In this image, you see a case of a municipal school in Ubatuba. At the time, I was studying a local project with a local NGO called SU, and there was a demanding from the school administration, was even a complaint, because from one side of the wall, there was a sink where water was always being produced. They washed their hands, they drank water, and forgot the faucet open many times. And on the opposite wall, there was a urinal. Our suggestion was simply to connect the drain of the sink in the urinal in a way that the water would wash the urinal, and we could spare the water that was used in the urinal. Every room can supply this irrigation to different areas. So you can have water from your kitchen irrigating some fruit trees, for instance, in front of the west side, so you will have a shade on the warmer side of the house. At the same time, you have a fruit production there, easily accessible. Besides, if you start to calculate, if every person consume more or less 150 liters of water per day, the proportion of gray water is more than 100 liters. And that is just one person. So it's a great amount of water that can be used for some applications. One of the simplest uses we can do for gray water, and in this case I'm going to show you the water of a kitchen sink, is to direct this water that will have a little of soap and remnants of food to irrigate fruit trees. So the simply action of washing a cup will make this water here to irrigate a guava tree, a fig tree, and some other ornamental plants, some Xanthosoma sagittifolium, and some pineapples. So this is a choice that we make. This is not a switch. This is not a problem. It doesn't have to be treated, but can be used for the only job that literally I have to do here. Actually, there are two. I need whether to change the straw or add more as the straw that is inside this place of filtration start composing. And the other one is to collect the fruits, in this case, a guava and the fig that's still growing and the leaves of the arrow leaf elephant ear that I could take to salt her. So the second task is simply to cultivate. I bring some straw, leave the water flowing with nutrients, and collect the food. It's that simple. Another thing that I did here was to create a flexible system in which I can opt to irrigate the fruit trees that I have here, or if I prefer, I can send it to the biodigester that you see shortly. So I can connect on this piping that goes to the fruit trees, or I can send it to the biodigester. With this same design, I could take it to another group of fruit trees. It's important to understand the nature of this house water flow. For instance, from a shower that has a constant flow, which has a constant flow of water, over the time that the faucet is open. Same thing with the sink faucet, which is very similar. However, washer, laundry machine has, is quite different because machine hold the water and throw this water out with a pump. So whatever will receive this water needs to be designed according with this water volume that is produced at once. We can apply directly to a ditch dug around fruit trees or you can use a technique of the circle of banana trees, which is more appropriate, especially for washer machines. 
because it has a higher capacity of storing water. So all that dried material, straw, putting inside the ditch or the firewood. In the case of the banana tree circle, it will do this composition of carbon with the nitrogen that comes from the soap and cleaning products. And this will create an aerobic environment. This will create an environment where there is a space there. The water will infiltrate and at the same time will create a new type of soil because all this material will decompose and we are creating a very active space. The amount of beneficial microorganisms on the soil surface, it's huge. It reaches the average of 100 million microorganisms per gram of soil and just thousands of them in a depth of three meters. So what we are doing inside these ditches is to simulate this soil surface. So not only plants can take advantage of this water, but also there will be a process of purification of this water as it infiltrates the soil. And at the same time, we have this huge possibility to produce fruits and foods as you have seen. When you talk about the process of purification itself of the water, it's not something that we are creating. Actually, these techniques uses micro and macro organisms that already do this task in nature. Think about a river that receives a load of sewage and soon after, if it does not receive anything else, it will purify itself along the way. So our challenge is to use techniques adequated to our context and take a advantage of a strategy that allows and creates environments for these microorganisms to act in a entirely way. What we want is that they are in an environment where they are happy and fulfilling their role and won't have to do any effort for this. So from bacteria to microcrustaceans, each one of them has a role to play. In addition, there is a chain that interconnects each one of these elements. We can call it a hierarchy, so to speak. The bacteria are the ones that act in the front line, and as the water gets purificated, then little further is where the microcrustaceans begins to emerge in this food chain, so to speak. In this chain of breaking these nutrients that are present in the water. We just have no idea of all the work that is happening when you look at a root zone tank, for instance, with the water of microalgae to microcrustaceans, even the protozoa. So that is this whole universe of life that's happening there. So when you start to talking about black water, one of the techniques that I like a lot is the vermifilter. It adopts a logic totally different of everything we hear these days. The vermifilter is a technique of water filtration. It's not a technique that works with water detention, such as septic tanks, evapotranspiration containers, and biodigesters. It simply acts as a filter. It has a support layer between 35 to 50 centimeters of sawdust, which is the substrate to develop Californian earthworms, which feed off fresh matter. This material, as it is being dumped, when you flush, the solid matter stays in the substrate. The water grows through there and the earthworms will digest. So the water doesn't have time to be contaminated. And this is the smart idea because in this flow, end up taking a little bit more of humus. So it takes a little bit of color due to humans produced by earthworms but it's a water with a lower content of contamination. And then you can complement this purification process with an infiltration of fruit trees if you have a lower water table. Or if your water table is high, we can work with root zones. Another approach to deal with black water is the evapotranspiration tank. The catch here is to create a field totally impermeable where we have a chamber to receive coarse material. This chamber is perforated, so the material goes from inside the chamber to the sides of it, where we have a thicker debris or gravel that will work as a support for the bacteria development. 
and as more sewage comes to be deposited in the tank, this volume that is already inside will rise going through different layers of materials, from the thickest to the thinnest, until it reaches close to the surface, where the banana trees, xanthosome massagetifolium, or plants that have high potential of evapotranspiration, receive in this water the microorganisms associated with the roots transform these nutrients in assimilable nutrients and the plant evapotranspirate so if you are in a dry environment for instance in our semi-arid climates you have virtually the return of this water to the atmosphere you don't have a affluent emission of this tank in other words, there is no exit of water in this tank. But here in Southeast, who is doing a evapotranspiration tank has to deal with it. And then it's convenient that you have at least a tank of infiltration, a banana tree circle, for instance, where you can do one more step of purification of this water. And the fruits that is produced in this tank are healthy ones. They are safe for feeding, all of them. I'm here with this integrated biosystem that is implanted in my house in the Amagestro space in Pedra Bela, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the integrated biosystem is a arrangement of different techniques which are made for some objectives that in this case I want to fulfill here, which is electricity production, nutrients recycling, biomass production, and water purification. The main element of the biosystem in this case is a biodigester and the biodigester is a technique that was inspired on the digestive track of the cows on how it works if we think about it this tract has four different stages and these four stages they develop from the entering of fresh organic material and in the end, you have as a byproduct the biogas, which is a composition of different gases, of which methane gas is a combustible one, and also you have the liquid effluent. This liquid effluent, in our case, is the one coming from the house. Although our talking until now has to do with sewage and water served in your house, that is another source of resources that is usually discarded, which is remnants of kitchen that can help you to increase your gas production. So actually all the organic matter that is decomposed in water will produce gas. Some materials produce more or less gas. The rest of crushed organic that can be crushed manually or your blender, even in your food processor or even in the sink crusher, it will supply you with a volume of material with high potential in gas production. As I said, you can attach this directly in your sink outlet, or you can have another inlet where you simply put this material. In this case, I have one access here, because my crushing at the moment is made in the blender. So after crush in the blender, I simply dump it here. This piping, take all this material to the biodigester in a piping of 75 millimeters with an inclination of 3%, which is good enough. And there I have a increase in my gas production. If you have a restaurant or an enterprise that produces a lot of organic material, whether it's from the kitchen or fat material, where another enterprise where you generate a lot of fresh organic material, you can do the same thing. I'm sitting here on the digester dome. By my side here, I have a gas exit. This gas is going straight to a stove in a kitchen in the upper plateau. And also I have a lamp that lighting to illuminate this area of the biosystem. In the flow of the biosystem, after the biodigester, we have the clearing box where these paper reeds are planted. These cyper papyrus are on a screen. The water flow is vertical ascending, is coming from the bottom. This tank is one meter deep. The flow comes from the bottom, goes up, 
go through the paper read routes. The function of the clearing box is, is simply to keep the pressure of the gas inside the biodigester. So this chamber equalizes. So as the gas is produced inside the biodigester, it presses this column of water that is inside, and this column of water, in contrast, presses the column of gas. In this case, I did some intervention, some alterations, which is to plant the paper reed, the cypher papyrus, the big and the small kind, in this clearing box to take the advantage of this water flow to initiate the filtration process and withdrawal of nutrients. So from here, we can see clearly by the health state of the plants and the roots development and the development of the plants in general. We can see that this plant is extremely healthy and it's taking all this health precisely from the nutrients which are present in these waters. And at the same time, it allows that this water comes a little bit more pure for the next stage, where I have a sequence of tanks, also with macrophytes. So the paper reed is a macrophyte plant that we call emerging, because it emerges from a substrate, the paper reed and the mini paper reed. In the sequence, I have a tank with floating aquatic plants. And the big catch about using floating plants is that the floating plants grow very fast. Imagine that I have a production this time of year of 30 kilos of biomass in these four tanks that have a total of eight square meters more or less so every two weeks 30 kilos this is because floating plants don't have to fight with gravity they simply spread around and we are able to see that they release sprouts on the sides and each of these sprouts is a new plant and all this space was occupied very fast so why do i want to produce biomass here because our space was occupied over the years by eucalyptus tree for charcoal production and the soil is very degraded so I'm using this as a strategy to withdraw the nutrients so I can relocate these nutrients wherever I want. I can simply take these plants and use them as a soil coverage wherever I want. They will decompose over time and turn into soil. And because of their structure that has this capacity of holding humidity, and when they are over the soil, they will still retain this humidity. So besides bringing humidity that is in the plant itself, they will continue to retain moisture and this will help in soil restruction. I also could use this for animal feeding. I could crush and give it to cattle if I had some or other animals, such as swines. There are other plants we have here, the salvinia, we have the azola, and I also have the lemina. But now, in terms of production, because of the very structure of the water hyacinth, we can see that it produces a much higher quantity of mass compared to the other plants, which are much smaller. If we take a look, I have the salvinia here. It has a, a very different structure, although it reproduces quite quickly. However, the quantity of mass in a weight that I can get from it is relatively low. But as I said, it's important to have diversity, not only for the function that it's making on the system of helping to clean water, but also in function of the macro and micronutrients, but especially the micronutrients that it can assimilate. The azola fixed nitrogen from the air in the water. It was traditionally used in the old flooded rice production in Southeast Asia, also with this function of nitrogen fixer. And we can use it here in the same way. Inside all the tanks that I have, I have another experiment, which is a root zone with a floating structure. Traditionally, 
root zones are planted on substrates of aggregates or stones of different shapes or even sand. As you can see, we are dealing here with emerging plants. It's another type of plants, also macrophytes. Although they grow in the surface, they have a lower growth rate. Root zones is a purification system of used water through which a series of microorganisms that are present in the water, they associate with root plants and transform this organic matter that is in a gross state in nutrients assimilable by plants. So what we can notice is a vigorous growth of the plants that are here. I could be choosing some types of plants to make a specific use within landscaping. Let's say I want to produce plants to be cutted. So this is an ideal place to do this because it has a flowing water with a constant flow of nutrients more yet in a system like this where I am recirculating the water and has a very fast growth, I could simply cut it and take it to the market to sell and very shortly I would have more flowers stems here to be used. Its grow rate is not as fast as the floating plants because floating plants are already over this nutrient solution, so they simply spread to the sides. And the root zones have to deal with gravity, so it has to do an extra effort to transform these nutrients in fibers. And all of this requires a certain amount of energy and the nutrients themselves that are converted in all of this biomass. If you want to produce fibers, the emerging plants are the best way in root zones. But if you want to produce more mass, your best bet will be working with floating plants. But keep in mind that floating plants will demand much more managing. They will demand that you do periodically withdraw and make use of them. So the root zones is a system of water purification that can be used not only for used water, of a house, a enterprise, or something else, but also to purify the water in husbandry areas. For example, if you have a pig farming or confined cattle, and you want to transform this water used to clean these tables into biomass, you can use a sequence of tanks with aquatic plants, and these formats that you have shown that can help to purify all this water. I hope this conversation has been inspiring and this can help you to reflect and act towards the reconstruction of the way you deal with your sewage and starting looking at as a source of valuable resources. The web address is on the screen for contacts and information. You can check us anytime and we keep going. I wish you all a good work.